we know from decades of education research that in order for teachers to teach their students well, they have to know their students well, which is a fundamental assumption that undergirds this idea of belonging since the introduction, which we spent the past two years researching. However, the vast majority of Black and Latinx children in K-12 classrooms have teachers who possess fundamentally different life experiences, opportunities, and cultural values than themselves. Across most of the country, only 7% of Black students attend a school district where the percentage of Black teachers equals or exceeds the percentage of Black students. That number is even lower for Latinx students. Ultimately, this can create a cultural rift that can lead teachers to misunderstand their students, develop implicit biases, and create classroom environments that can be threatening for students of color. Now, while these problems are pervasive to all content areas, they're particularly pernicious in secondary mathematics. We know uh, that historically, um, math educators have been notorious for seeing their domain as culture free, all while, all the while neglecting the dehumanizing and alienating um, experiences that many students of color and women face in math education. Second, post secondary STEM consistently draws some of the lowest levels of participation and retention among Black American and economically underserved students. Uh, and mathematics still lags behind science, technology, and engineering in these trends. And these STEM trends um, are most stark, as I said, in mathematics, um, but also speak to generations of disservice and a lack of opportunity. And then third, the rigor in secondary mathematics begins to increase right around the same time that adolescents are beginning to develop the cognitive capabilities to recognize the stigma attached to their racial ethnic group. This racial consciousness can create an added stress during an already stressful developmental stage that can result in a spike in dropout and push out rates for students of color that begin to reach their height by the 10th grade. So considering all of these issues, our goal was to develop a framework that can support teachers in understanding their students well and cultivating learning environments where their students are firm to thrive. So we conceived of belonging-centered instruction as a teacher's provision of social and pedagogical supports that can mitigate student alienation in mathematics classrooms by providing opportunities for active inclusion, achievement, identification, and empowerment. And these opportunities are enacted through two main ways. First, interpersonal supports, and then instructional supports. And interpersonal supports are the relational aspects of the classroom that can lead students to feel that they are a valued member of the classroom community and known and seen for who they are, irrespective of their mathematical proficiencies. And these interpersonal supports are really the warm-up that can facilitate better instructional supports, which are the pedagogical aspects of the classroom that can promote a sense that students have the opportunity to see themselves, see their lives, see their interests reflected in the mathematical content that they are being asked to learn. But both interpersonal and instructional supports for belonging work in combination with each other. Each alone is sufficient without leveraging the affordances of the other. And in our work, we've come to see that interpersonal supports are very much a warm up to creating more instructional supportive opportunities. But what makes BCI different is really the way that it was created. Uh, while there have been decades of belonging research, much of it lacks an equity focus and often fails to recognize the heightened relevance uh, of belonging for people groups who have historically been denied belonging, namely black and brown people. To combat this, we use black and Latinx students' own narratives about what belonging means to them as the inspiration for this work. This centered students as experts on their own experience of belonging versus solely relying on belonging frameworks that have been validated among predominantly white and middle-class populations. So we began with over 250 hours of interview data with middle and high school adolescents discussing sense of belonging in their own math classrooms. Our team then coded core themes that emerged from students' own words and descriptions of belonging. 
Next, we observe dozens of secondary math classrooms from uh, across the country, from cities such as New York City, Dallas, Memphis, Charlotte, uh, and ultimately we combine the patterns that that we observed from uh, from those classroom observations with the patterns of student interviews and negotiated all of this with psychological theory on belonging. And from this emerged a belonging-centered instruction framework that is not only grounded in theory, but also honors the perspectives and the experiences of students who are most in need of belonging support. So these are the key dimensions that emerge from the process on the left and the red. You see the interpersonal supports for belonging with sub-dimensions of social emotional bridging, communal orientation, and empathetic awareness and support. And then on the right in the blue, you see the instructional supports for belonging with four dimensions. One, does safety to be wrong, decentering teacher authority, mathematics to know myself and my world, and high standards and rigors. So after scoring over 400 secondary math classrooms across the country, our team was really excited to find that the quality with which teachers enacted these sub-dimensions predicted a range of student outcomes. For example, two interpersonal sub-dimensions and one instructional sub-dimension work together to predict increases in student engagement. Multiple uh, sub-dimensions also predicted increases in student sense of agency, meaning students felt a greater sense of competence and that their ideas mattered within the life of the math classroom. One sub-dimension, decentering teacher authority, predicted increases in math achievement even after controlling for previous year's math achievement. And multiple dimensions actually predicted for student persistence in mathematics. And of course, our team was really excited about the power of these predictions. However, they still only present a segmented portrait of BCI and the power of BCI. So next, I wanted to show one example of how teachers can enact this principle. So let's take a look at how one high school algebra teacher simultaneously engaged multiple dimensions of belonging-centered instruction within her approach. I try to point out their successes and not so much the ones that they have wrong. So for example, on an assignment, they have, let's say five questions. Of the five, they only got two correct. I make a big deal about those two that are correct. Um, so I'll say, look at this. You could have gotten a zero, but you tried your best and you got two. We're making progress. Now let's look at the three you got wrong. I write speeches on their test papers or whatever I give back. Now look at your, um, look at your mistakes. See if you can find them. If not, see me at lunch or after school. And then I'll point it out. Remember you told me you didn't know how to do this? You did. It's your arithmetic you messed up. Two times six isn't 14. So you knew how to do the property, which is what I was teaching. So you do get it. Um, yesterday, I was like, oh, I can't stand this. I don't know what I'm doing. We're substituting systems, using solving systems with substitution method. I don't get this. We're circling this. We're moving into that. We're, I don't get it. Um, I'm like, Girl, come up and do this with me. So she's up and we're teaching together. And then everyone's like, what do you mean you don't get it? You just did it. She's like, I did, right? I'm like, yeah, you did. So they, come, they have this preconceived notion that math is hard. I was never good at it. I won't be good at it. I can't stand it. I try to make them do the work more so they can see that they're doing it. All right, so there's a lot going on here. So let's break this down to see its component parts. So first we see Mrs. Simone engaging in safety to be wrong, um, dimension of BCI, where she's working to create a space where students don't feel stigmatized for wrongness or for needing support. And here she attempts to disarm students' self-doubt, push them beyond their negative emotions, while also providing high quality, targeted and affirming feedback. And here she's intentionally working against students, making conclusions about their mathematical belongingness simply based on the correctness of their answers. And through this, she shows an awareness of who students are, their strengths and challenges, but also couples that awareness with empathetic support, which is highlighted here um, in, in the red. Doing this really brings a humanizing quality to mathematics and invites greater participation from students who have historically been underserved um, in mathematics. 
However, her empathy and awareness don't come at the expense of high standards and expectations for her students. It's clear this teacher still expects a lot from her students. And here in the green, we see that. We see her high demand and high standards. Although she doesn't stigmatize wrongness, she doesn't ignore it either. And here she's actually asking students to engage in the painful process of exploring their wrong answers, but this doesn't come off as stigmatizing or overwhelming given how she couched this demand within a safe and empathetic climate. Note how she holds this one student accountable for their arithmetic error, all the while showing them how correct their thinking was at the very same time. And then finally, uh, here in the blue, you know, this teacher elevates the rigor by having students team teach with her. She's tapping into decentering teacher authority when she's doing uh, this, which is actually a more demanding form of teaching and learning compared to passive banking models of um, instruction. But Mrs. Simone doesn't hesitate to share her authority with students and honor their voice in explaining challenging concepts. This practice comes from her trusting of her students and her awareness that they understand more than they give themselves credit for. So overall, this text really begins to illustrate both the simplicity and the complexity of BCI. And hopefully these dimensions and their actions um, are easier to understand, but in real classrooms, they can be challenging to facilitate with high fidelity, although Mrs. Simone makes it look easy here. So ultimately this work can not only help teachers identify and adopt various sets of practices that support students' sense of belonging, but this work also provides a nuanced insight into how teachers can work these practices together to facilitate a belonging climate that's greater than the sum of this part. Uh, the sum of its parts. And finally, um, next month in February, we'll be launching a beta version of our virtual platform where teachers can upload real video of their math classrooms, um, record it with their smartphones or with iPad technology that we provide uh, and receive high level one-on-one -on -one personalized coaching and analysis from our research team, dissecting their teaching patterns uh, and hitting opportunities using the BCI framework. That's something that our team is really looking forward to, to elevate the impact of this work um, for teachers um, within urban environments, but also across the country. Thank you, everyone. I just want to acknowledge our project team here below. Thank you.